little less than three years ago, there was a string of terrorist attacks in the middle of November that swept across the Middle East, including a bombing at a funeral in Baghdad, a massive bombing in Beirut, Lebanon, and a day after that, there was an attack in Paris, which inspired the hashtag, Pray for Paris. A couple days after that, my mosque in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, held a prayer service in which we invited members of the local community to come in and have a conversation. We would get to know some of them, they would get to know some of us, and then collectively we would pray for all the victims of all of the terrorist attacks. As a youth leader in the center, I was invited to say a couple of words alongside my brother and my sister. It wasn't easy because it was a very tense environment, a very difficult situation to speak in, but I got through it as did my brother and my sister. Our imam said a few words, and then he invited the space for others to speak. He simply said, would anybody else like to say something? I heard a very familiar voice, a very lovely voice. It was my mother's voice. And she said, Sammy would like to say something. And immediately, I was momentarily shocked. As a youth mentor in the center, I know all of the children, and Sammy in particular, I remember the day he was born, I remember playing with him as a toddler, I remember him running around, I remember his first words, I remember teaching him things from Quran verses to how genetics work and the inner workings of the stock market. He's a very, very bright kid, and he's really shy. So immediately when I heard that he wanted to say something, Something went off that told me something was wrong. This was serious. But I looked up and I saw this eight-year-old kid get up out of my mother's lap, walk quietly up to our imam, take the microphone from the imam. And he said, I'll never forget what he said. He said, we didn't mean to cause any trouble. We are not the terrorists. And I lost it. I absolutely lost it. Tears just came spewing out of my eyes. How could we live in a society where a little kid, little kid, eight years old, feels the need to defend himself? And not only himself, but his family, his race, his culture, ethnicity, his way of life, his religion, his people, in front of complete strangers. How did we get here? And how do we fix it? Unfortunately, the environment and the experiences that Sammy has gone through in his life, they're not a recent phenomenon. I was one of the first generations of, of Arab Muslims to grow up in a post-9-11 world. And I didn't even know what that meant. I was four years old whenever 9-11 happened. But, I experienced a lot of the same things that Sammy has. Growing up in a rural, conservative town, in school, I was insulted. Not by a lot of people, but there are a few people here and there. And I've been called things, like dunkun, sand nigger, towel head, rag head. I've even been called Muslim as if it were an insult. And as a little kid, I didn't know how to deal with those things. I retaliated often the only way I knew how, which was with my fists. And I got in little scuffles here and there, and I didn't get in many fights, but little scuffles here and there, morning activity before school or recess or bathrooms here and there. It wasn't everything. I didn't experience it every day, every week, but it was there. So I know firsthand what it was like 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And I know, just by virtue of being a mentor to the youth today, what they're going through. And it's only gotten much, much worse. And it's getting worse at an alarming rate. In the last three years alone, hate crimes against Muslims in the United States have doubled, and hate groups have tripled. And the anecdotal evidence is overwhelming. I have story after story after story of 
Muslims being verbally or physically abused, whether it be at a school bus being told to go back to Pakistan, which isn't even in the Middle East, or a teenager getting a death threat in, the, in their locker room. Even here at Penn State, a liberal institution, I've seen this happen. So how do we get here? For most of you, this number might mean different things. But for me, it means a very specific thing. 1% of the US population is both Arab and Muslim, which means that only 3.5 million out of 340 million people in this country have the first-hand knowledge, experience, and understanding of what it means to be Arab and Muslim in this country. Which means for the other 99%, for the other 337 million people, most of those people have to get that understanding and that, under, that knowledge of what it means to be Muslim and Arab from secondary sources like the media, which is flattering to people who look like me. But you know, there are other outlets like political leaders, which are more flattering to people who look like me. So, what happens is that our voices, our very real experiences of what it means to occupy the social position that we have are drowned out. We are effectively minoritized. But I want to make something clear. Being a minority does not mean that you are minoritized or vice versa. You can be a majority and still be minoritized. Minoritization fundamentally occurs because the dominant narratives and cultural viewpoints present in our society and our communities overpower and subsume the real experiences of a certain group. To give you a clear example of this, you can have a college campus with 60 to 70 percent women. But at the end of the day, if one in five women are still being sexually assaulted by the time they graduate, Women are still minoritized. So, when I was younger, if you had come to see me in high school, you would never think that I had the experiences that I had. And I had an understanding when I was at a young age that people do not inherently want to hate each other. It's not, hatred is not a part of our human genome. And I had a revelation of sorts, and it was that you know, I'm a pretty fun guy. Like, let's be honest. Like, who wouldn't want to be friends with me? So, I realized that people didn't hate me because they knew me. They hated me precisely because they didn't know me. They didn't hate me because they knew me. They hated me because they didn't know me. And that fundamentally changed how I operate in this world. I started having conversations. I started reaching out to people who felt like they hated me. And after having conversations with them, they realized they didn't. When I came to Penn State, I found an organization called World in Conversation. It's, a con it's an organization that facilitates the face-to-face -face interactions on conflicts that we tend to avoid, the necessary conversations that we need to have in our society and in our communities. This organization, World in Conversation, is facilitating here at Penn State, in addition to having Penn State students also talk to global partners in Gaza, Colombia, and Afghanistan. And I believe that we have a commitment to dialogue. I believe that we have moral responsibilities to our communities. I believe that whether you are minoritized in any sense or not, you have a responsibility to your communities, to the communities that you serve, whether it be here at Penn State or a different community. And what I want to suggest to you today is that what I'm sharing is merely a case study of minoritization. We've heard from a lot of different speakers today, and they all shared many different things. And I'm, I hope that you're able to see how many other groups have been minoritized in the same way that Arabs and Muslims have in the United States. So we've come full circle. I know how I would answer this question, and so does Sammy. As people with a minoritized perspective, we're stuck in a box. It's our entire world. It pervades every aspect of our life. We can't ignore it, but you can. And that's why we had hashtag pray for Paris, but not hashtag pray for Beirut, or hashtag pray for Baghdad, or hashtag pray for Syria, or pray for Palestine. 
So you can simply take a step back and remove yourself from the situation. And that's precisely what I encourage you not to do. As somebody with a minoritized perspective, I'm willing to share my story and listen to yours. So together we can collaborate and move forward in our communities. But conversation's a two-way street, and I need you to do your part. So reach out, and let's have a conversation that matters. Thank you.